Hi, I'm Larry Wolf, co-director of NYU Florence. And I'm Perry Class, co-director of NYU Florence. Welcome to NYU Florence, Villa La Pietra on Zoom. We're really excited to be participating today in this discussion of the Acton Photo Archive Project. It's a wonderful project. We're thrilled to see it go forward and we're really glad to be here with you. But we wanted to say a few words about one of the photographs in the collection. It's the photograph of Arthur Acton and Hortense Mitchell, um, parents of Sir Harold Acton. They're together in 1903 in this photograph in front of Villa La Pietra, and they're with their brand new Fiat automobile, 1903. Love this photograph because it tells us that the Actons, whom we associate with the Renaissance past, they're going to transform the gardens at Villa La Pietra. Um, they're going to cultivate Renaissance gardens at Villa La Pietra. They're going to build their famous Renaissance art collection funded by the Chicago banking fortune of Hortense Mitchell. But they're not only looking backwards to the Renaissance. They're two people who are also looking forward to the 20th century. And their Fiat automobile tells us that they're modern people who are looking forward to the 20th century. We think of them as great travelers, as people who got tremendous pleasure from exploring Italy and making their collection, but also people who traveled more widely. And we see them here with their car, in a sense, as adventurers, as travelers, as people who are going to find this new technology and use it to explore the country around them. 1903 is the year that they first rent Villa La Pietra, I believe, the year before Sir Harold Acton was born in 1904. It's also a landmark year in the history of technology and transportation because it's the year that Orville and Wilbur Wright, the Wright brothers in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, fly an airplane for the first time. 1903 then is a year that completely transforms the history of technology and transportation for the 20th century. Of course, the 20th century is going to be an airplane century. It's going to be an automobile century. And also, much more than the 19th century, it's going to be a photography century. And um, one of the things that's exciting about this project is that we see um, Arthur Acton and Hortense Mitchell engaged with photography, and we can study that through the Acton Photo Archive Project. So we see a couple of different technologies in this photograph. Then when we're looking at it, we see that that technology of photography of recording their lives and keeping track of new important moments like a new car. And we also see the new car, that new technology for travel and for exploring and for riding forward into the new century. Um, one of the things that is great about this Acton Photo Archive Project is that it brings us closer to the Actons, that we can study them as they document their own lives. They are interested in documenting the history of Villa La Pietra through photography. And that's also our history, the history of NYU Florence. We're really, really glad to be participating in this photo archive project. We're really excited to be able to discuss it with you here today. So welcome to this discussion. Welcome, thank you for being here. Good afternoon, my name is Costanza Caraffa. Since 2006, uh, I have been the head of the Photothek at the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence. In these long years, I um, have been reflecting uh, on uh, the fact that the photographs uh, have to be considered three-dimensional material objects and not only images. Uh, they exist in time and space and move through various social contexts. And one of these contexts is constituted by the photographic archive in which they are preserved. An archive is an ensemble formed not only by photographs and their mounts, stamps and inscriptions, but also by card catalogues and inventory books by the photo boxes, their special arrangement on the shelves according to the classification system of a specific photo collection, as well as by digital instruments. They all interact within the archive's habitat. And from this perspective, photo archives can be uh, understood as ecosystems, 
open, dynamic and complex structures formed by different organisms which act and interact with each other and their surroundings. And I think that uh, this uh, um, theoretical framework uh, that is also a methodological one and is uh, uh, strongly uh, shaped by material culture studies uh, is uh, applies very well also to the Acton archive uh, we are looking at uh, uh, during this uh, online symposium. The um, archive is also a place, or the ecosystem of the archive is also a place where archivists and scholars operate, and these are us. Uh, we are the people uh, together with uh, um, all the um, collaborators who um, work on the uh, digitization of the archive, on the uh, cataloging uh, of the holdings, uh, uh, the, the uh, restorators and so on. They all uh, operate within uh, the archive and shape the photographic documents uh, with uh, archival practices and also with technologies. It is a very important point in my eyes that we should consider uh, during this project, N not only the fact that uh, the uh, archive, uh, an archive with uh, so many different uh, kinds of uh, photographs from uh, the private uh, um, family collection uh, of the Actons, uh, from uh, the villa, from the um, uh, art collection, uh, and from a very different context, um, are preserved here and uh, uh, it is a necessary and a good thing to digitize them and put them in an order and make them available for future generations uh, of scholars. We have to be aware, uh, first of all, that there is not one story or biography of the Acton archive or of the many single photographs that are preserved here. We have to do with many narratives and open narratives that uh, will be shaped uh, not only by us, but also by uh, our colleagues in the future. And we have to uh, be aware of the fact that uh, uh, what uh, uh, we and you are actually doing uh, uh, with the archive at the moment will shape uh, the archive and its possible uses and functions uh, in the future. Hello to everybody, my name is Tiziana Serena, I teach History of Photography at the University of Florence. Let's start. What is the photograph's context? Often, when we look at photograph, we think that the meaning is very clear. We see the thing itself, persons, houses, mountains, lakes. At the first glance, probably, we don't see the author of a picture. And more often, we don't perceive a context. So to speak, any photograph has several contexts. The first one is the periphery of a photograph, and it is related with the materiality, the cardboard on which we can discover and written information, addresses, data, stamps, and if we observe it with more attention, we could discover also other clues extends signs of a time past. The second one is the archive. It is my photograph alone. Does it have any relations with other photographs? And which kind of relations? How I can figure out how to recognize the context on which my photograph receives other meanings? Let me show you an example from the Acton's photo archive. This photograph strikes my attention for a few details. The first one is just personal. I remember a table quite similar. It is the table I saw at an aunt's house in Venice. The second one is the little text at the corner. I can read in Italian, un pezzo, one piece. The third one, I can understand that somebody moved the table in front of the window in order to enlighten it on the back an empty room. But why? To understand better, I need to investigate the photographs as 
a photographic object. Its irregular borders invite me to turn the object. Now I can see two unwritten text and one drawing. Inside it I read Marmo Africano Colori, African colored marble, and on the right side of the picture, Venetian Longi period. The text gives me additional information about the photograph and the object, the colors, the dimensions, but they also suggest a deeper insight to ask at myself who wrote the two texts, who took the photograph. If the photograph is a document, what is documenting? I can answer only if I know the several contexts of my photograph, from a small periphery to the archive, considering other photographs, other documents, and so on. Of course, my aunts helped me just to remember that he looked at as her table, but he wasn't. The photographic appearance is always misleading. Buongiorno, I'm Francesca Boldri, an art historian and a teacher with a focus on collecting, museum and conservation history. Photographs have always been, for me, an essential tool for documentation and for research. I'm fascinated by light and how it changes everything from color to temperature to room atmosphere. The word photography tells us how light is important for its technique. It was in fact formed by joining the Greek words for light and drawing. Since 1999, I wear also the head of collection manager at Villa La Pietra, a house museum open to the public since 2003. I deeply love this position because my university training in Italy and England in museum studies and my research area both turn to make me appreciate the hidden features of, the, of this collection. Vast, diverse, and still displayed as it was left by the owners, the Acton Collection includes works of art and furniture, spanning from the Roman age up to the early part of the 20th century. It comprises evidence of material culture, personal belongings of the family, the books and circa 35,000 photographs. It was donated back to NYU by Sir Harold Acton upon his death in 1994, but the collection rather reflects the collecting taste of his parents, Hortense Mitchell from Chicago and Arthur Acton from London. Starting from 1903, for about 30 years, in this 15th century villa, a home and a performing stage for their new life in Italy, the couple raised their children. Harold and William planted and grew a garden, organized parties and theatricals, and collected works of art. Vivere collezionando, this is how I like to describe their operato. Living is gathering and arranging art and cultivating artists and friends famous and less famous, as their guest book and the hundreds carded visit invented by this Derry reveal, like the patterns of in the, in the Renaissance, but with an eye open to modernity, always looking ahead with the cars, fashion, transatlantic journeys, learning new languages, installing electricity and hot running water, and buying record players, stereoscopic machines and camera. Photography was a favorite way to cultivate all their passions and to bridge with modernity, and the Actons discovered and exploited this right away. This large photo collection showed that they use, produce, and consume photographs for themselves, but with a strong awareness that photography is becoming an art and an extraordinary communication vehicle. The private and the public walls overlap all the time here. This 1916 Happy Family photograph, annotated on the verso by Hortense, who was a rigorous reporter, she's the one who creates all the family albums, documents a happy art field to Rome, to the Four Imperiali. It tells us about the family interest in archaeology. Hortense studied archaeology in Berlin in 1888, about the comfortable travel fit and about Arthur's direct way of consuming art. He's an artist by training, let's not forget this. Therefore, he looks at art, he takes photographs with his own camera, a German Leica, as we learn from the annotation diverse of a Swiss landscape photograph. He measures objects, as many notes on verso indicate, but he also touches the marble relief and feels comfortable about it. Vivere collezionando, again. 
The date brings us directly to World War I, but despite difficulties, the family can travel, probably with their own car, to discover with little Harold La Città Eterna, and I believe to see two art exhibitions that took place in 1916 in Rome, promoting contemporary artists, Esposizione Internazionale della Secessione, and selling antiquities of great interest for the ca- collecting couple. Another example of this extraordinary photo collection, now becoming an institutional photo archive, thanks to the efforts of NYU, investing in terms of resources, expertise, from curators to technicians to conservators, and to be recognized as a rich ecosystem, as Dr. Carafa described it, is the second photograph, dated around 1925, of this so-called Camera dei Genitori, or Parents' Bedroom. As many other interior and garden photographs documenting accurately the effort of the collecting strategy and the use of the house and property, the image is a document of the change of the home display, showing us that the Vasari's holy family has just entered in the villa, hanging above the fireplace. But it's also a document for the art and object state of conservation at a specific date, and it is a useful source when compared with other collectors' interiors and public museum arrangements. Passing from hand to hand, as seen from fingerprints and sign of wear and tear, this photo was printed to become a postcard, as seen from the verso. The publisher is in fact the famous Ferrania, since 1923 a film company. Many of the garden and interior photographs are printed as postcards. The family uses postcards all the time to track their travels, they use them as diaries, but also to disseminate their work. If not yet an archive in their minds, they have an instinct to build and organize a memory and a legacy. Following the Acton vision, NYU digitization and cataloging project is now building the archive. The private becomes public. It is first organized and understood, second preserved and finally inserted in a system that makes it become recognizable and universal. I feel privileged as curator of the project to benefit from qualified personnel from our own university staff and faculty and from an appointed professional company, Centrica in Florence, who has invested a team skill in technology for high resolution imaging and reproduction and believes the importance of crossing the gap between the humanities and science. I'm excited that many NYU undergraduate and graduate students are working on this project side by side with us. One of the pleasures of working with and in a photographic archive is the great privilege of browsing through images that have been recently inventoried, rehoused, digitized, or cataloged. Certain images are well known, having already been selected for exhibitions and publications, but for every image extracted from the collection and placed on display, thousands of others remain hidden from view. These lesser-known holdings are full of unexpected discoveries that remind us how dynamic and multifaceted archives can be. I first came across this particular image when preparing a group of photographs for long-term preservation. It comes from Series 1, Subseries E, which contains images of unidentified subjects connected to the Acton family, men, women, and even dogs. It's a fascinating mixture of subjects and photographic forms, from professionally produced carte de visite to family Kodachrome candids. In this subseries alone, I have stumbled upon family portraits with newborn babies, glamour shots, sumptuous banquets, and even a boy in a suit riding an ostrich. These images represent the side of the archive most closely tied to act and family life in particular, the people, family, and friends with whom they spent their time. Many of the images were taken on the grounds of Villa La Pietra, including the one that I have selected. This photograph shows a man sketching in the shade of the Pergola delle Rose, or the Strada Lunga, as the Actons called it. On the back of the image, March 1956 is written, and judging from the date, we are likely looking at a photograph of one of Harold's friends, perhaps shot by Harold himself. Harold had returned to live at VLP just a couple of years previously following the death of his father. This intimate and candid photograph, 
taken while the artist is wrapped with concentration and perhaps unaware of the camera, seems to reflect a new, more relaxed atmosphere on the estate. Among our particular hopes and expectations for the eventual publication of these photographs online is that NYU students, faculty, and scholars around the world will help us to come to understand more thoroughly our collections and the historical context that produced them. Perhaps we will then learn who this unknown artist was and why he came to visit Villa La Pietra in the early spring of 1956. Hello, I'm Nora Kennedy, photograph conservator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and lecturer at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, working with both art history and conservation graduate students. I bring more of a technical perspective to this conversation and want to highlight what a delight this collection is from that viewpoint. I've cheated a bit with my one image uh, to present a rough timeline of the history of photography, all illustrated with images from the archive. Along the upper portion, we see some of the more standard processes from the history of the medium. And the Acton Archive certainly encompasses all of these from the earliest cased images, here represented by a daguerreotype, up to the chromogenic color time period. With the digitization of the archive, we now move it full force into the digital era. While in my view, all family archives hold interest for different reasons, the Acton Archive holds special fascination for what it represents. It is unusual for a number of reasons. The collection comprises a large number of photographs in unusual processes uh, than an ordinary family archive might. For example, during the 2016 Overview Conservation Survey, my colleague Peter Mastardo and I noted unusual stereo autochromes. These are hard to see, I know, but they're at the lower center of my slide. Now, autochromes are the earliest commercially viable color photographs, but the stereo format I had not seen prior. And I would say in general, it's unusual to have autochromes in a family collection. There are also pigment-based carbon prints and platinum prints. There are portraits made by uh, prominent artists of the time. Indeed, the turn of the century, from the 19th to the 20th century, that is, during which the archive was growing apace, there was a proliferation of a wide variety of photographic processes. This family was not only committed to the aesthetic, traveled in artistic circles, but also was interested in technology, a perfect synergy of passions for the art of photography. In terms of the condition of the photographs in the archive, there's not time here to go into much detail. Suffice it to say that in general, all are in very good condition with some exceptions related to what we call inherent vice. Uh, for example, color photographs that have shifted in tone and also some damages from use, whether from excessive handling or being on display for long periods. All in all, the archive provides a wealth of possibilities for future study and learning. I very much enjoyed the opportunity to see it in person, and I'm, I'm so glad to see it getting some well-deserved attention. Thank you so much. In the photographic archive of Villa La Pietra, we encounter a diversity of photographic materials, including negatives and positives on glass or plastic supports, and various formats, including stereoscopic photographs. Negatives on glass, in particular silver gelatin dry plates, are the earliest heritage documenting the family while living at Villa La Pietra. Since we are talking about glass, we can easily understand the inherent fragility of such photographic objects. So while the glass can break mostly due to unsafe handling, the silver gelatin emulsion, which carries the image, can chemically deteriorate through a sulfiding process, accelerated by wrong storage conditions and bad quality enclosures. The effect that we can detect on the image is known as silver mirroring, a phenomenon that you may be familiar with. But when we talk about preservation of negatives, our main concern are plastic supports. Nitrates and acetates are both, are both present in the archive, 
and can decay to a severe degree, up to a total embrittlement and, uh, and loss of the image content. A very important distinction between nitrates and acetates is the flammability rate, since nitrocellulose is actually a shock-sensitive explosive, while acetate was introduced to the market as safety film. Both of them derive from modified cellulose, and when they start to decay, they release acidic compounds that lead to the depolymerization of the cellulose and oozing of the plasticizer. As a result, we have distortion and embrittlement of the plastic base. All of that leads, at first, to a partial delamination of the silver gelatin layer, and it may end with a coliquation of the gelatin itself. At this stage, the final stage, the image is lost. But how can we detect the deterioration of nitrate and acetates? So both of them, at an early stage of decay, can show cockling and distortion. We may also detect a peculiar smell. Nitric acid, of gassing from the nitrate base, reminds of licorice. But when the gelatin is also affected, then a very strong odor of rotten egg appears due to the interaction with the sulfur compounds of the gelatin. Acetate releases acetic acid, and this is why acetate's deterioration is also known as vinegar syndrome. The smell of vinegar tends to be pungent and easy to detect even at a very early stage of decay. Acetic acid may also interfere with the chemistry of the anti-elation layer, reversing its transparency and causing blue or pink stains. Unfortunately, there is no conservation treatment that can reverse these forms of decay, but the situation can be monitored using acid detectors such as the Image Permanence Institute AD strips. And it is also very important to find a sustainable compromise and acts on the storage facility, keeping a reasonable cold temperature and low relative humidity and guaranteeing a proper ventilation. Buongiorno, I am Elisabetta Corsi, an art historian working for Villa La Pieta, NYU Florence, as the digitization technician of the Acton Photo Archive. My company, Centrica, has been selected, among many other companies, in the field of digital imaging. Centrica specializes in the design, development and marketing of digital solutions in the field of cultural heritage. The digitization of the Acton Photo Archive, preserved at Villa La Pietra, is an extraordinary project for many reasons. The sites of the archive, the several typologies of visual materials, and the continuous dialogue with all the other collections of La Pietra, garden, art, books, with the Anglo-American community and also with the city of Florence. This is the reason why I have chosen this photograph in which we can see Arthur Acton taking a part in the Gincana, a kind of car competition that took place in the Cascine Park in Florence in 1901. I'm working on the first step of the digitization process. I take care of the handling, the cleaning, the scanning, the quality reviewing and the post-processing of the photographs. I would like to add a technical input about our approach with the digitization of the different typologies of visual materials in the photo archive. Briefly, we use different technologies and different workflows for each typology of visual material but we always keep a very high resolution. For the more than 1,000 negative and positive images, we use an Imacom virtual drum scanner. The acquisitions have to be done at 1,000 ppi. For the more than 20,000 small prints and postcards, we use an Epson A A3 flatbed scanner. The acquisition has to be done at 600 ppi. For the glass plates, the photo album and the oversized prints, we use a photographic reproduction table with a light box behind with cold light for the glass plates. After the post-processing, we obtain 24-bit TIFF files for every kind of acquisition. 
At the moment, we have already digitized more than 15,000 small prints and all of the photo album. Now, after the rehousing of this material, we are ready to digitize the negative and positive films. The variety of typologies that coexist in the Acton Photo Archive makes this a perfect place for teaching lessons about the history of photography, of art, of costume and many other topics after a deep study in class or at home of the object already digitized. I am Pamela Ferrari from Centrica, PhD in Science for the Conservation of Cultural Heritage. In the photo digitization project of the Acton Photograph Archive, I am involved in entering information in the online database, TMS Collections by Gallery Systems, and evaluating the condition of materials. So, in two words, I deal with cataloging and rehousing. Cataloging in an online database is essential in order to access collections even in a remote way and to acquire information on objects belonging to them. I choose this photograph to illustrate this perspective. Actually, this photo about Harold Acton at the end of the 1960s at a dinner party in a Palladian villa near Treviso, in the near northern Italy, is rich in information to enter into TMS collections. This data, partly derived from the finding aid inventory created according to Alta Macadam notes, and partly from the photograph itself. The acquired digital image is associated to the TMS collections record of the photograph, and then it is completed with information about the photograph subject, date, inscriptions, material, technique, and conservation status. Clearly, these data are entered in TMS collections following strict established guidelines. Up to this moment, May 2020, the cataloging of Series 1, related to the Acton family, has been completed, and now Series 2, related to Villa La Pietra, its gardens, estate and collection, is in progress. Regarding the second activity in which I am involved, the rehousing of materials of the photo archive, I have chosen this photograph from the sub-series about William Acton, that depicts a model possibly posing for a portrait by William. This photograph, like all the ones in this sub-series, was stored in a box. Because of conservative needs, we decided to rehouse them in acid-free photo albums, placing each photograph in a mylar sheet. A rehousing currently in progress is about negative and positive films, previously stored together with photographs and now moved in a safer location, since the degradation of these materials pose risks to objects close to them. Other future rehousing operations could be about historical albums and oversized prints. Clearly, these procedures must be carefully prepared ahead together with the whole photo digitization team and NYU curators of the project, in order not to create any problems in the archival order. In this year, both cataloging and rehousing of the Acton Photo Archive included several activities in which NYU students were involved, for instance, counting objects to rehouse, linking images to TMS collections records, and entering some data in them. This cooperation is possible also during the emergency of COVID-19, as we are benefiting from an online database accessible with an individual password. NYU interns, we will hear from Arnav Minaikia, can in this way continue their projects. Thank you. My name is Arnav Benaike. I am an undergraduate student at New York University, and for the past months, I have had the privilege of working at Villa La Pietra as an intern. I have had so many fascinating experiences, from helping to document the significance of a crown statue of the Buddha in the Biblioteca, to learning about the origins of photography while working on the Acton Photograph Archive online database. One of my first projects at Villa La Pietra was to count and catalog the many thousands of photographs in the Acton Photograph Archive. 
I remember so clearly when Francesca showed me the two large boxes, each containing tens of special acid-free folders with hundreds of postcards each. It was almost like seeing the Uffizi gallery for the first time. I was bewildered and overwhelmed. There was so much art and history contained in these pieces of paper. The archive has postcards collected from every corner of the world, Libya, Indonesia, Peru, and even some from my country, India. I quickly realized that while these postcards were indisputably beautiful representations of the culture and architecture of our collective past, they were also so much more. I found myself noticing things like the British colonial eye advertising the exotic in postcards of Ceylon, the anglicized colonial name for Sri Lanka. Many postcards in the collection also told the story of journeys taken by the Acton family. One of these sets of postcards that caught my eye in particular document a road trip across Italy taken by the Actons at the outset of the First World War in 1914. It is possible to piece together the story of this journey since Hortense Mitchell Acton meticulously annotated the reverse of each postcard with the date and current location. She often also includes other information such as the hotel the family was staying at and her thoughts and observations. The postcard that you see on screen is one from this journey and was purchased from the Undicesima Esposizione Internazionale d'Arte, which in English is the 11th International Art Exposition. This was an event held in Venice between the 15th of April and 31st of October 1914, which the Actons presumably attended. The art of this postcard is intricate, using a complex perspective to show Venetian canals and art exhibition stalls. What I found most interesting, however, was Hortense's annotation on the back. Although some of it is illegible, I would like to read it to you. She says, War declared, all countries hastily preparing, Italy to remain neutral for as long as possible, but nothing may be exported. Children in England harrowed to stay there. I should not leave Italy but go homeward. Warships busy taking motors and sailors going out to ships. Similar to most other art, these postcards did serve as a showcase of the wealth and influence of the Actons. They truly lived in a bubble and had the financial freedom and security to travel the world in an extravagant fashion such as this, even during a time of such uncertainty. I quickly learned that postcards allow for a far greater expression of true personal identity than traditional art objects. Their expendability made them a canvas for the thoughts of the collector that did not require much commitment, and this makes for what is by far the greatest feature of postcards that they were and continue to be a rich archive of the ordinary rather than the extraordinary. As a photographer and a professor of photography, I've had the privilege to explore the Acton Photograph Archive since the mid 2000s and be able to incorporate some of the photographs into my teaching. I have decided to focus on a double version of a studio portrait of Hortense Mitchell Acton, the woman who fell in love with Villa La Pietra and bought it in 1907. I chose these photographs because they give me a chance to talk about how we look at images and how we interpret them. During the photo session at Studio Photography in Paris, it can be assumed that Hortense had two photographs taken. In this one, she's photographed in a quiet, traditional pose for those years. She looks at the photographer while holding a bouquet of flowers in front of a mirror. The photograph is mounted on a mat and the logo of the studio is clearly visible. In this unmounted version, the story takes on a different direction. Hortense seems lost in her thoughts looking at the bouquet and in the mirror reflection, one can barely see Hortense's coronet of pearls because her reflected face is painted over. This photograph has always intrigued me. What happened? What was the story behind an act of erasure of her face? Did she do it herself because she didn't like how she appeared? Did someone else do it? And why? It is such an open theme that could be investigated and disputed over and over again. I've always thought that some research should be done on this image. Additionally, I've chosen this photograph because it builds on the specificity of photography. The power to conjure up the past because it is a record, or maybe more correctly an interpretation, of what has happened in real life. But also because being part of a family album, it becomes a platform for conveying imaginary tales. Family photographs and albums may become vehicles to a fantasy that allows for a momentary space to perform visual construction of who we humans think we are and hope to be. Thank you.
Hello, this is Michelle Marincola. I'm a professor of art conservation at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. And it has been my pleasure and honor to work with the staff and collections of Villa La Pietra since 2002. I help supervise the conservation treatments and technical research of the Acton Collection in Florence. And this work is chiefly done by teams of graduate students from the Institute's Conservation Center under the supervision of expert art conservators, both Italian and American colleagues. I also work with graduate art history and conservation students facilitating their research in the villa for an eventual online catalog of the Acton Collection. For all of this work, we rely on the important historical photographs of the rooms at the villa, which show us not only the placement of objects and internal relationships that the Actons created, but also, and this is important for art conservation, the condition of works of art. Artworks, of course, have long lives and they can change a lot over time. These changes, which constitute a kind of biography for each object, are seldom recorded in early written records, but they might be captured in photographs. Conservators, therefore, use old photographs to understand the past condition of artworks and the types of alterations they have sustained. For technical art historical research, past changes can tell us a lot about how the function of a work of art, for instance, an altarpiece, has been adapted to reflect new practices. Using the photo archive at La Pietra means digitizing it. Photographs, as you have heard, are fragile documents, and too frequent handling or exposure to light causes irreparable damage. Digitizing a photo collection is an essential preservation step, and one that helps us capture and maintain the information value 